I'm Chip Bach, and welcome to Blue Rock. On each episode, we'll discuss what life is like on this big blue rock, where we are all headed, separately and together, what changes we need to make to ourselves, the planet, and towards each other, and just discuss what daily life is like for your fellow crew. And maybe, just maybe, we may also see a commonality that connects all of us. Another episode of Blue Rock. Today I've got a very special guest, uh, a woman I've known for quite a long time. Her name is Pat Kirkland. She is the CEO and Master Executive Presence Coach, creator and founder of Pat Kirkland Leadership. She's the creator of the Predator Prey Partner Model of Leadership Styles and Coaching Methodology. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. She specializes in executive coaching with clients that include PayPal, Meta, who used to be Facebook and other companies, Microsoft, and a host of other leading innovation-driven firms. Her life's goal, this I found interesting, her life's goal is to champion the evolution of human communication to move move humanity one step closer. For those of you who follow Blue Rock, if that couldn't be a more perfect fit for this podcast, I don't know what else is. So, uh, Pat, welcome to Blue Rock. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And actually, Pat, I got a little something special for you. If you hold on a second before you okay. get going, I want to give you a little, <laughs> little intro. Can you hear that? <laughs> I've got a big hidden studio back here, Pat. You don't even know. There's all these people off camera. They're all excited. They showed up. They're just friends and family. Don't, don't feels good, Chip. Going. I feel welcome. Thank feels you. <laughs> all right. We'll let them settle down there. Again, thanks for coming, Pat. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so, Pat, one of the things before you get before we get started into this, you started your career with CBS News in New York. I just, yes. I just noticed well, that. I did not know that. It's Tell actually that. tied to this larger purpose of you doing the work you're doing and us having this conversation. Um, so, what I noticed growing up is that my the culture. So, I grew up in the um, Northeast, right outside of New York City that I was being presented with two ways of being as an adult. Either I could be aggressive and get things done, or I could be a doormat and people would like me. And what was happening was my ego was too big to be a doormat and my heart was too big to not be regarded. And, and I'm, I'm looking around and I'm not seeing any role models. And then I thought, you know, people are really enjoying situation comedies. What if I got into, you know, CBS, ABC, NBC, something like that before there was everything else. And I were to work on creating a situation comedy that specifically, Chip, taught people how to communicate. That, I mean, that was what I was going for because you entertain them and people watch. But then, you know, the so that was all just based on 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 your life experience at the time, meaning like your interaction with people trying to get a job, uh, college, relationships, what have you. You just kind of always felt like you were on the outside, not outside looking in, that would, that would, that wouldn't be the same, but kind of like not a perfect fit for one side of the personality. Or I the had other. To, it was I mean, like, I was presented with extremes. Okay. And the extremes were painful for my personality and I literally couldn't find another way. So then I get into CBS and, uh, I was in CBS news and they didn't want to talk to me in production. And I thought, Oh, I just hit a dead end. So the rest of my career has been doing this specifically to identify a way of engaging with people, whether it's business, personal community, that um, has an expression of mutual respect for self and for the other. So I've actually been on this since I was about 17, 18. Wow. Yeah. See, you guys, you're not the first person I've talked to that had this early life epiphany, and I'm so jealous of you guys because I too came from a town in Westchester County, just outside New York City, uh, super hard driving um, academics, right? Everybody's fighting over where they have a 4.1 or a 4.0 or what have you. Um, the, the parents petitioned and got rid of class rank because God forbid, you know, Susie be ranked 87th with a 4.0 and a 1600, you know, SAT. And then all of a sudden Dartmouth say no because of their rank. So just crazy hyper competitive yep. and like you you know i'm kind of this 
bigger personality, but I've got a big heart. And, and though I was, I never wanted for anything. I came from a, you know, successful family. There was all that programming, or as I've been told as a protocol that we all kind of go through where, okay, you got to get him to the right college. Then you got to get that job. Then you got to get that 401k and you got to, you know, bang along, which again is what I've done. Um, but it, it's weird how I had more of an awakening probably around 2013. Um, and, but for you, you okay. saw it so young and I'm so, I've given that to our daughter, mm-hmm. which is awesome, but man, does it make me jealous? Cause I'm like, God, I missed all of that. <laughs> I could have done so many other things and all this time, uh, had I just kind of went, Hey, wait a minute, there's another way. I don't necessarily have to just tote the line, so to speak. Well, so. for me, Chip, I didn't see another way. And that's what I set out to find for myself because I was suicidal. I mean, it was not, I was wow. not a good, yeah. Okay. Um, my life was, was that, breaking it was... down. At the age of 20, Got it. I'm working for C and my life is breaking down. So, so a little graphic. Um, I researched how to kill myself and I thought, well, let me you know, give it a shot to see what, I, you know, again, still in research mode. And I thought, wow. oh, this hurts. And I, at that moment, I went, oh, I have to take the slow, painful way out, which means therapy. Because the big, <laughs> quick, painful way wasn't going to work for me. And it literally started me on wow. this journey. I'm still on, yeah. So uh, this is interesting because in a lot of my, what I've been going through since 2013, a lot of my research study, people that I've already interviewed on the podcast, there's been a very common thread mm-hmm. that that type of, strife or trauma Mm -hmm. they now view as a gift yeah not as a negative is that how you see it um that experience maybe not at the time but now looking back that that spurred you to go to where you are now there's a it's a i'm working through that because it created so much pain and it was Mm. so i was so on the edge for so many years and what i'm seeing now so for your listeners when I was starting out, so we're talking the early 70s, we don't have the collection of resources we have available now. So I'm like, right. I'm speeding up. I'm moving so quickly through this stuff. So I'm, I'm more able to recognize, uh, I made a distinction this morning in my head around mother nature versus mother culture. And I'm like, oh, I'm recovering from mother cultures raising me. And that I still have right. my mother nature. Um, right. And that more of the therapeutic options available today recognize that and can help heal. Are you seeing that applying to everybody now? A similar, they may not have been able to articulate it the way you did, but that's what they're experiencing. That they're realizing that they were raised by more mother culture and mother nature has been there all along and they're starting to I swing back. I think Are you seeing that? This in some conversation of the clients, is going to... Um, can make those connecting dots. So I think it's awakening. Okay. And okay. Th- what was exciting for me this morning is I have it down, you know, metaphorically, mother nature, mother culture. It's, you, you hear it and you're like, oh, wait a minute. I, you can almost unpack it from the concept. Uh, so for me, that's the work I'm continuing to do yeah. is to, we're not going to get up to warp speed, but, you know, can we pick up the pace? You know, because I had a, a moment chip about a year ago and I thought, I'm going to be dead before I'm done. At the rate I'm going, I will be dead. And then somebody suggested sacred medicine. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. My late 60s, I'm going to go, (laughs) sure, I'll try some drugs. Are we talking talking like ayahuasca, like that type of thing? Uh, Yes, it was um, ecstasy and then... Oh, it was a cocktail. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, yes. I was with therapists. It wasn't one thing. It was... Well, it was, one, it okay. was three things in a day, and then I did it a, a month later. And okay. it created my, my experience of it was it created more space inside me. I had been yeah. feeling like I was in a, you know, from our upbringing, the mother culture, yeah. I was in a straitjacket. And I could, even though I was working on stuff, I couldn't turn around. And then it created this space and a perspective for things. So I think everybody's getting ready for this. And the yeah. work you're doing, offering these conversations, the work I'm doing, which is capturing what's going on in a way that you can think about it, I think are, you know, we're doing our part to move it in that direction. So yeah, I I'm think trying, people are I'm getting try- ready. Yeah, I'm trying to bridge the 
man, I, I, I got to tell you that what you just said, the mother, you, you got my brains just now just went, oh, because you said mother culture, mother nature. First of all, if you don't turn that into a book, holy cow, <laughs> like, please, there's your title right there. That's, oh, that's, should, that's nice. really should be your next thing. Boom. Thank you. That would be a bestseller. No joke. Because Thank to me, where I'm at, instant resonate. Like it resonated like, oh my God, I get it. That, that like, you don't say anything else. That's literally what I've been experiencing <laughs> my whole life and where I'm trying to go. And yes. you just said it in one thing. So it was like, wow, huge epiphany. Anyway, so yes, please turn that into a book because that's awesome. Um, but when I, when I hear that, um, it, it also resonates with me because this is some of the things I've been experiencing. As you know, you know, I've been a corporate professional climbing the corporate ladder um, for my career. It's, it's, I have no regrets in that. I've, I've uh, made a good live. I make a good living still today and, and uh, it's afforded, you know, a lot of resources to my family and to myself, et cetera. However, um, it, it, that, that, that shackling that you're feeling is a big part of it, right? Yep. So what ends up happening is, you know, I lead a team right now and I make jokes about it all the time that I am, uh, as a matter of fact, do you know Todd Zog by any chance? Oh my God, uh, the name's Todd? familiar. Yes, yes. So Todd Zog uh, wrote a book called The Warrior Sales Monk and he has a corporate consulting, you know, coaching company, which is Matrix, right? That's not what I want to talk about. What I wanted to talk about was the fact that from Todd's perspective, it's kind of that same thing of this and he and I talked about it um it, it, there's this restriction that's going on uh and then trying to figure out how do you have a conversation with somebody who's still what I refer to in that three-dimensional reality right which is what we've been raised in that's kind of the, the right. vibration level that we're supposed to stay at right job appointments your outlook calendar blah 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 right just bearing down you know uh, mortgage taxes etc um, talk to somebody like that and then still be able to have a conversation about what you probably experienced in your expansion of the more sacred medicine and have them not go, yeah, you just lost me. Like you're, you're getting in what, what everybody always refers to as the woo woo part, right? Like you're getting a little, you're getting a little strange. Um, but that feels, I'm trying to do that on a day to day basis. And I make a joke with my team and say, I'm way more monk. Than I than than warrior anymore. When I started, wow. and when you met me, right. I was way more warrior, right? Sales, drive, 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 go get them, get them, get them. And now I'm very even. As a matter of fact, they just did my disc assessment a year and a half ago, and they just sent it to me today. You know the, uh -huh. the old disc system. Um, I'm dead even across all the colors except for I is really high. Still really Whereas high. Whereas <laughs> when too. I met you, yeah, but when I met you, it was the, that red. Oh, what is that? The red? The D. Uh, the D. Oh my God. Ooh, they needed like three more pages, right? It's that hardcore <laughs> driver. Now all those, all those other two are dead. They're down like middle and just flat. And I remember speaking to the instructor about it and went, is that possible? And she was like, yeah, absolutely. You, you've changed how you see the world. And that relates so, to what we're talking about today. So you're flagging for me a book reference for your, the listeners. It's called Unwinding Anxiety. And he makes a very important point. I mean, I think the book is really powerful. I mean, I read it, reread it, made notes on it, and it's changing my insights. He makes a distinction around a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And a fixed mindset is this, you know, you're talking about how do we talk to people? This is who you are. This is your lot in life. Make the best of it. And a growth mindset is that everything is mutable, that I can continue to develop myself. Growing up, I was introduced to a fixed mindset. I had crippling self-worth. It was horrible. Um, but then in and of myself, my nature within me, I'm the oldest of seven, it was around looking out for people, becoming more than you can be. So I think that's the idea is to introduce to people in a way that there are two mindsets. And for the work I do coaching, I mean, that says this is the mindset I believe in. So right. I think that's a, um, a way to begin to so introduce that, ideas. That sounds a lot like, have you read The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks? No. That sounds like his book. So The, the Big Leap talks about that we have zones. So you have your, like, your zone of competence, uh -huh. right, which is where kind of like you could do it in your sleep 
kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then you may have your zone of excellence, which is, you know, I kind of feel like that's where I'm at now, right? I'm very good at what I do. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time. I'm well-respected. And again, almost to the point where I could, you know, fairly do it in my sleep. It's challenging from one day to the next, but not like I'm not stretching, right? So to your point, this is where my, my cap was, right? And then there's the zone of genius. And that zone of genius is where you go. Wow. And that's where people get stuck. They get stuck at either that competence level because it's comfortable. It's safe, mm-hmm. right? This is what I do. I'm a... I'm a doctor. This is what I do every day. I see patients. I go home and maybe I go fish on the play golf on the weekends. And then it starts all over again. And that's, I've accomplished what I was led to believe was it. Yes. Meanwhile, there could be, doesn't mean everybody has that. Somebody has to be a doctor, but there's a lot of people that could go way beyond it. And that's that zone of genius. And we talk about it here in our family all the time. My wife is from the same part of the country as you, you and I are both from, and she had the same problem the, this mm-hmm. this limited yes um belief about herself about where even though she's very strong and powerful willed and believes that there's more there was this unconscious and we all had it i had it too right i i, I any i think anytime you feel guilt it that that's a part wow. of that kicking mm-hmm. in right guilt is i think a big limiter for people yeah and then and then obviously ego is too even though most people will tell you i strongly disagree just so you know with with um Einstein, uh, not Einstein, um, Freud, on his mm. definition of, of ego. Um, I think it's hurting us. I, I, it's, it definitely is great for giving you confidence, but when so, you start to lead with ego, I think it's a problem. Let so. me present an idea. Now, this is fresh out of the book, so this is like four days That's ago, great. five to go, days ago. And it's a book about individuation uh, by mm-hmm. Murray Stein. And so metaphorically, and I think that's the way to... to share what we're learning with other people is through metaphor. So metaphorically, mm-hmm. I'm a caterpillar. I've been crawling the okay. face of the earth, knowing I want to be a butterfly, but stuck in this caterpillar life. And so I've been doing um, multiple forms of therapy. And again, the therapy options now um, are, I'm working with one called NARM, N-A-R-M, and it's, it, it knows how to transform trauma. Well he explained this whole process of caterpillar to butterfly in a way that my brain went, oh. And he was talking about the first half of our lives. That's the mother culture part where we're, you know, we have our identifications, you know, you're the breadwinner, you're the responsible one, you've got to achieve all those things. And I see it as a ball with a bunch of divots knocked into it. And as Mm -hmm. you come out of it, you've got to knock those divots out in a way to, to a greater level of fullness. But then the second half is we start working with our unconscious self, with our our mother nature in a way. And what the alchemy that happens, Chip, is that the conscious part of us, as we can release our identifications, working with the unconscious part as they become integrated, we become a third thing. Butterfly. I'm like, oh my God. So it's, it's really a life's work to free ourselves from what we're talking about, the restrictions. Correct. And it's, you can't. It's tough to do if you have a fixed mindset, because in a fixed mindset, I'm a caterpillar. I was raised by caterpillars. That's my lot in life. Um, But the freedom that's coming from the transformation to butterfly is extraordinary. And again, understanding it makes it, uh, gives a perspective. One of the interesting things in the book, he talks about that catastrophe serves us. Well, every time I have a catastrophe, Chip, I get bent out all over the place. And now I'm like going, oh, oh, it's another opportunity. That's me. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. I'm going to butterfly. It's hard to change that mindset that, hey, thank you for giving me this horrible experience I horrible. just had. Horrible, yes. Yeah. But once you do it, wow, is that freeing. Wow. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You no longer hang on to any baggage. Right. Um, that was literally, I'm not kidding. That's literally the, I just, just did a podcast with Sonia Barrett, and she spoke about that. Like, that was literally what she's talking about, how... um you know, she went through an experience where she had an abusive marriage mm. and uh, to get away, literally had to just pick up her two kids, oh. get in the car and lived in her car for two months. But ask her about the experience now. She's like, it was a gift. Oh, yeah. And you, and you just go, what? How can that sounds horrible? I never went through this where I came from in the Northeast. And she's like, oh, no, absolutely a gift. Mm-hmm. She goes, you have a choice every single time. Yes. You can go, woe is me. I need help poor me and go into a corner or you can go 
No, this is an opportunity for me to learn something or do something differently so that that doesn't happen again. Either way, those are all positive things. And I went, wow. And I knew this, but I still forget it because that mm -hmm. constant three-dimensional low vibration of what did you, what do we, what, what, I just lost your words well, again. The what fixed did you say? mindset versus growth mindset. No, the book name. What was oh, it? Uh, <laughs> mother nature, mother culture. Mother culture. The mother culture is <gasps> persistent. He's right? a mother. <laughs> you can, you can come into your office and be like, I'm all open. I just did my meditation and I'm good. And this is all not real. And I can manifest and bend. And then all of a sudden, like, what do you mean we're out of stock on whatever and this person's yep. willing to, uh, uh, and the next thing you know, you're chasing the rest of the way. Uh, one of the guys that works for me always sends me a gif of a, a guy running down it. You ever run down a hill when you're a kid in oh, a yeah. grass hill and yeah. you're, you start going faster than your legs can go? That's the gif he has. Is this guy going, oh. blah, 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 and he's like, this is the day I'm having. <laughs> and that's us responding mm -hmm. to this low three-dimensional reality. But if we, to your point, if you can just take that moment and go, hold on, there's a reason for this. I'm gonna find the reason, it's not real, mm -hmm. and flip it, and then all of a sudden you don't get so sucked in. And the transformation it's just, but it's is constant the practice. Yeah, the transformation yeah. is the flip it part. And the yeah. book that I mentioned, Unwinding Anxiety, the author is Dr. Judson Brewer, and okay. he's talking about these learning loops that we established when we were young that paid off, that are no longer serving us, so that book is a valuable tool for how do I get to the point where I can flip it? Right. So along that same line, so you're, when you're talking about things that the loops that we got into when we were kids, one of the things that I discovered uh, in the last couple of years, which I've now given, I've given this book away to everyone I work with. I think they probably, I don't really get much response sometimes. A couple of people have said, dude, best book I've ever gotten. Others, I think they're kind of like, eh. It's called The Emotion Code by Dr. Bradley Cooper. Have you, have you read that? No, so, Emotion Code. So the, the Emotion Code. So okay. what he discovered, he and his wife, they're both psychologists, they discovered this years ago, okay. that um, there are trapped emotions in us, right? Um, that wow. can come from either early life experience, mm -hmm. life experience, so meaning throughout your life, or better yet, they can be inherited, mm -hmm. so past generation to generation wow. in utero. Uh, or just absorbed by the people around you. So okay. you can create these emotions. You can absorb them from somebody else. They're not even yours. You just absorb it because you're energetically, that gets into the whole quantum physics string theory that energetically we're all actually interconnected, right? The only difference between us and a table is the vibration of the molecules, mm -hmm. right? At a molecular level, we're all the same. That's a whole nother show. Um, anyway, uh, but it's it's... It's amazing to me and how, how he figured out how he created this list. It's two columns, an A and a B column. Uh, in each line, I think there's like four emotions. So each column has like six lines in each one of, so think of it like a grid, in each one of those boxes. So in column A and column B, there's six boxes. In each box, there's maybe five to six emotions, just the okay. words. It uses muscle testing. So there's different types of muscle testing you can do, but you start with a, a, a base question like, you know, my name's Pat, my name's Anthony, right? And if you, you know, the yes or the no, if it's yes, it'll hold. If it's not, it's basic, you know, that, that stuff's old. But by doing that, you now then uh, start saying, do you have any trapped emotions that need to be released right now? And your unconscious mind through muscle testing will answer that. Then once you discover it, you can say, okay, do you have, and this is the crazy part. This is insane and it is 100% accurate. I've used it now for two years with myself and others. You're not looking at the chart. So the person that's doing it with you is looking at the chart. You have no idea what's written on there. And all they do is say, do you have a trapped emotion in column A? Oh my God. Nope. Do you have it in column B? Yes. <laughs> is it in an odd row? Is it in an even row? And once you center down on the block, then you start asking them, is it this? Is it this? And the answer will, and I've had people literally, when I hit it, they get a yes and tears start coming out of their eyes and they don't know why they're crying. It's literally that deep wow. in there. So then what happens is you take a magnet and if you're doing it to the other person, you run it from the back of their brain, it has to do with the meridians. This is, this is now Asian science. Uh, you run it down their back. And if it depends on, through the process, you're asking them, was that emotion? Once you find the emotion, you ask them then, 
Was it inherited? Was it created? Or was it absorbed? Wow. The body will answer that. It's if absorbed or created, you run that magnet down three times while setting the intent in your mind that, that you're clearing this from the person. If it's inherited, you do it 10 times. Wow. When you're done, you ask the person, did we release this trapped emotion? And they'll, and wow. you, you see people completely shift energetically. Wow. And you can remove trapped emotions that could have been with them, not only in this lifetime, but passed on from previous lifetime or previous generations in utero. They've proven now that the emotions can be transferred from mother to child in utero, which is why somebody will look back and go, well, nobody told me that my body was horrible or ugly or gross, right. but for some reason I've thought this since I was three, right? And they have no idea why, and it was because the mother had the same trapped emotion and it got passed uh, generationally. From oh, that's a next. powerful it recommendation. It is so powerful. And, and the author really, again? Really good. Chip? It's not, you know, hold on. You see, you can see we trap a lot of emotions, Pat. I have it right behind me. Um, <laughs> it's the emotion code, okay. Dr. Bradley Nelson. Thank you. Yeah. It's extremely good. Oh like my said. God. Well, I've but done again, it taps really into all the stuff you're talking about, right? It's right. Well, that to me is this, you know, the first half conscious, the second half unconscious. That's a tool for working with the unconscious and communicating and learning. Correct. Wow. Correct. It's tremendous. And what happens is once you release it, it, it it's so freeing. I had a tremendous amount of guilt hmm. for no reason, by the way. No growing up, there was no reason for me to be guilty. My wife, when I, I mean, we've been married 20 years, she would say to me all the time, why do you fall into guilt all wow. the time? What is the matter with you? <laughs> like, why, there's, why are you feeling guilty about that? That's not your fault or whatever. And I just had it. Once I released it about three years ago, gone. Now, was that a passed it, down emotion? Uh -huh. Or was it? Okay, yeah. yeah. I was inherited. Yeah, oh, no, I was going to guess. <laughs> yeah. Came from who knows where. Who knows? Could have come from my parents. Could have come from my grandparents, great, great parents, mother's side. Uh, by the way, that's another part of that code that the, the, when you're going through it is that you're also asking, is there anything else you need to know? Because sometimes just recognizing that you had the emotion is all the unconscious mm -hmm. the body wanted, right? But other times it's like, yeah, there's, there's more. So you continue to, did you, was this because of your mother? Was this because of your father? You know, is there anything else I needed to know? And you just keep going and you go until it says, no, there's nothing else you need to know. Then you remove it with a magnet, retest, it's gone and gone. I've done oh, it with my daughter terrific. when, you know, high school's hard. Yeah. She just graduated. Um, and there, there were times, I'm not kidding. It got so much a part of our family. She'd come back like junior year, sophomore year, come back and just be like, dad, I, I, I need an emotion code. And she'd come in my office and sit down <laughs> in the chair over here. That's why it's sitting there on the, on the coffee table. And she'd come in and sit in my office and go, can you do an emotion code on me? And sure enough, within seconds, we'd find something. What's amazing though is I've used it so much that the majority of us in the family now don't need it. Right. Because the whole reason it's trapped is because we were never taught to process the emotion oh, as it's wow. occurring. Yes, yes. Once you recognize the feelings and you get rid of them, you can then start to no longer trap them. So we don't have trapped emotions very much anymore in the family, mainly because we process them. And I've tested it because I've, I've had it where there's somebody in the family reacting and I'm like, let's do an emotion code. And I tech nothing there. And they'll oh, go, man. no, it's, it's all out here. There's nothing trapped. I'm wow. everything I'm giving you right now is because I'm just letting it all out and letting it pass through me. Right. And then therein lies the problem. Instead of fixed. Yeah. So yeah. you can flow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Thank you so much. That's an amazing one. That one's probably one of the biggest life altering ones. Uh, things that I've little Easter eggs I've found probably in the last five, five years or so. Um, back to your stuff. And this plays very heavily into this. And, and, and I do appreciate you giving your time today because of, of all this communication that I'm trying to, to give our, our big blue rock that we all live on. Um, you do have something you developed through your program called Predator Prey Partner Model. Right. Um, I do feel like, yes, that's awesome in business, but it applies outside of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So this goes back to what I was sharing about when I was 17 to 20 around you need to become aggressive to produce results or be a doormat so people will like you. And again, I'm going into business as a 20 year old trying to, you know, and I, what do I jump back and forth? So I, I kind of really said, I refuse to go on until I find a better way. Well, it took me years to find a better way. 
and needed to make a living. Um, and there were a couple of profound things. So when you become the kind of learner I became, you, will, you are open to learning anywhere, anytime, from anything or one. And so I studied um, Aikido, a martial art of Aikido. And it differs from other martial arts in that the intent was to render the attack and the attacker unharmed. And one of the people, Lucy Frost, who I worked with, she helped me see, oh, it's beyond ego. Okay. And then I went on and I started, started studying improvisational theater five years. Now, it wasn't to wow. perform, but I realized improv players know how to function when things aren't working, when there's no structure. I want those skills. And then again, Chip, I'm like, Lucy made the connection. Oh, they function without ego. And so then there was, wait a minute. So improv is a body of work that can do that. Aikido is a body of work. Well, what does it look like in communications? And as I continued to do the work, I um, had seven painless, and I don't, they, they're not worth our time to go into them today, um, but one I do want to share. Painless lessons. So I became open to being taught by the universe. And I had a PhD uh, contact that I knew. He had a PhD from Stanford or something. And I kept trying to improve my materials, like, you know, because I'm not a salesperson the way you are, but I still have to sell for a living, right? And so I brought him my materials, and he's flipping through them back and forth, Chip. And then he turns to me and he said, well, maybe your product isn't your product. Maybe your product is your relationship with people. And my brain just went, oh, God. And, you know, I had to write it down because I, I thought I'd never had that thought before. I, and now I have to go understand it. And so that began the shift to what does it look like if, if this is about my relationship with people? And then I had a vision of, and this is not a real person, but in my mind's eye, I had a vision of a kid in high school who's kind of, mm, he, he doesn't exercise a lot, so he's kind of doughy. He's got mm -hmm. a full head of, of uh, brown curly hair. He's in the hallway. He's going through his phone. And as everybody's passing him, he goes, hey, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. And I realize he's not the quarterback. He's not the head cheerleader. But everybody likes this guy. Why? Right. right. And then I started to see, and then as I started to do it, I went, wait a minute, the aggressive part, that's more being a predator. That doormat is more like being a prey. And I thought, what is this third entity like? And the word partner came to me. And as right. soon as I had partner, I'm like, oh, there's the triangle. And for a long time, I thought partner had to be a split halfway between the two. But the difference is that predator and prey are about fight or flight that there's some tension there. And that right. partner is about mutual respect for self and others. So for mm -hmm. me, this is uplifting how we engage with everybody, whether it's our family members, our friends, our community, our business. So right. what I drilled down to was how do we do this non-verbally? Because he was just, you know, what he was saying wasn't critical, but it was the way he was engaging. Right. And so then I, um, I had another, as I was, kind of crunching this, trying to understand it so I could teach it. I imagine, well, you're, you're in a pressure situation. What do people respond to in a pressure situation? And I thought, well, doctors in emergency rooms are in a pressure situation. So if a parent's coming in with a kid who has an earache, and if you have had a child with an earache, you know pain, right? And the, the parent comes in, and I realize what they care about first is competence. Do you know what you're doing? And then as the, the parent and the child are in the, in the room and the physician is attending to them, then you care about respect. Do you, do you care about myself and my child? First, I want you to save their lives, get them out of pain, but then, you know, it's a broader relationship. So for me, the conversation for leadership, whether it's in our community, uh, in business, do you know what you're doing and am I in good hands with you? And so we can answer that non-verbally in how we use our voice, how we use our body. So that was the opening for me to realize, and there's, I, I knew it was powerful for a long time, Chip, but I couldn't understand why. And what I believe is that the limbic brain that reads nonverbal behaviors processes what it sees faster than the neocortex processes what it hears. And you're referring, you, I know you call that the, the lizard brain. 
right? Well, I'm, I think it's lizard limbic. I'm, I'm not a scientist, nor do I pretend to be one, but I can make it sound like I know what I, I'm I've heard, about. well, I've heard it, I've heard it also referred to as the reptilian brain. Yeah, I, I, I thought that I've heard it spoke is, that is way for common. a long time, but now there's something about the limbic brain mm -hmm. that it, it reads. It's the same part. Oh, okay. I okay. I not? was in my mind. I think it's the same. I think we're, I think we're talking same. about the same okay. part of the brain, but right. there's like a, you know, the, the, it's the fight or flight. Right. Right. Is that what you're referring to? So yeah. that's the reptilian lizard, you know, brain that everybody refers to. And to your point, it, 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 it's responding to vocal patterns and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's not actually listening. No, right? and, it, and it, it can't. It's responding to all visuals. But it's yeah. kind of nudging us to go, mm, don't trust them or it, it's all good here. So, right. so my work is about drilling that down and then finding the universal expression of leadership where we could go anywhere at any time. And there's a book actually recommendation I want to make for your viewers. So this is called Naturally Selected. Um, and it's the looking at evolutionary leadership theory. And what was fascinating for me, so I'm, you know, I start reading the book and I want to learn about leadership. And they're talking about the followers. And I'm thinking, I don't want to know about the followers. I want to know about the leaders. <laughs> and... They're I'm not pointing. talking to followers. I'm only no. talking to leaders. What's right. going on? Right. I mean, you yeah. know, I'm arguing with the with the authors. Um, <laughs> and their point was back hundreds of thousands of years ago when we were in small tribes, we could right. have a warring tribe, we could have weather conditions, we could have wild animals. What they identified was that a leader would stand, multiple leaders would stand up. Right. The followers had to decide who to follow. And their point chip was that it is in our DNA to recognize leadership. Again, right. do you know what you're doing? Am I in good hands with you? And so for me, that recognizing are all these nonverbals that we're talking about. Right. So, you know, I, I joke often about um, parents. <laughs> so here I am working with adults in the industry and they come up to me going, I really need help with my kids. Oh, my kids are making me nuts. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. So there's a particular behavior we call the warm downward inflection. And it's speaking with a sense of certainty, not a hammer, but a sense of certainty. Mm -hmm. So I give people, parents, an example. I say, so you take your kids over to the pool. You've got your friends and neighbors around, but you know somebody's got a dentist appointment. You got to get the kids out of the pool. So right. you want to, again, mother culture. You want to be seen as a loving parent. So you say, okay, kids, upward inflection. Time to get out of the pool, upward inflection, which makes it sound negotiable. The kids do nothing because they know they have time. Right? You try one more time, okay kids, a little higher, time to get out, right? Because you don't want to turn into a hairy monster in front of people you know. And then you know you're going to be late and you're, all right, out of the pool, right? And then you're embarrassed because you've lost your cool. And they think that's the choice. That's that fixed mindset. And so what I share with them then is the warm down reflection, okay kids, time to get out of the pool. And it's that sense of certainty. and. Their little brains go, oh, it's okay. It's time. I don't want to, but it's time to get out of the pool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's profound and universal. And, that, and I can't say we've got all the universal ones, but that's what we're going for so that this visceral experience of leadership is available to as many people as possible, a respectful yeah. form of leadership. It's, it's interesting because in, in my experience in the corporate world, um, and especially being on the sales side of things in various capacities. Uh, I always found it interesting that you would have certain sales leadership that really liked the reptilian or what you would call the predator mm. approach from a leader, right? Um, get them out there, get them selling, get the numbers up, hit right. the number, blow out the number, exceed the number at all costs, get it done, right? Um, however, you had a high turnover rate of people because they can't withstand a predator for long periods of time. They'll do right. it. Right. Right. For a short period of time. And then at some point when they've made enough money, they're going to go, I hate my job. And they're going to look for something else. And which right. is why then all those statistics that I'm sure you've oh, looked at before right. that come out and show why does somebody leave a job? Yes. Everybody always think, Oh, it's money. It's not money's it's like lot. fourth. Yeah. It's like way down. It's no, I, I they're not happy. Right. <laughs> and then you need to figure out, well, why are we not happy? Why are they not happy? And it's because there was nobody ever really paying attention to that. Why can't, you know, the, 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 the programming from a kid is your happiness is based on, do you have a nice car? Do you have a mm -hmm. nice house? 
Do you wow. have a 401k? Do you have dental and medical? And if, and if you have all those things and you're unhappy, what's the matter with you? Right. <laughs> right. Well, culture, That's the right. way we're programmed. Right. Um, so then you start to feel guilty if you're not happy and you have all those things. And then the therapy kicks in because <laughs> you're just like, I don't understand. Everybody says I'm supposed to be happy, but I'm miserable. And it's very confusing. And I think yes. that starts from the time you're a kid and it just yeah. gets worse. And the problem is, to your point, it's not just happening at home or at work. The TV's telling us this, the high school to me, uh, somebody, uh, there was, um, uh, I watch, anybody that listens to Blue Rock knows, I watch uh, Gaia TV like it's Netflix. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know whether you've ever seen Gaia TV. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's a streaming service, um, literally. And, and so I watch a lot. That's where I'm, that's actually where I found Sonya Barrett two years oh, ago. Okay. I made a joke with her that I started stalking her through the interweb about two years ago. And boom, she agreed to do an interview uh, with me now that I'm doing this stuff. I digress. The point I was telling you all that is, is because um, in listening to all of this, there's a programming that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And some of the people that I've been listening to that are kind of the thought leaders in this whole response is that um, when we're programmed to, um, to, to follow these things, and I lost my train of thought, I'm probably gonna circle back in a second. But uh, we're programmed in, into following this protocol. Mm -hmm. And then if we break protocol, you are punished for it, either literally or in some format. I know where I was going with this. School. So in modern Western school in the United States, which again, we all know that the current modern education system came from over in Europe and was designed to keep everybody as good cogs, right? It wasn't about what you wanted to do, what your zone of genius was, or what spoke to you. It was, here are the parameters we need, and we're gonna test you on them. And if you don't, if the program didn't sink in enough, which means you got an A, we're gonna make you retake the test. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't get the program for that school year, we're gonna make you retest, take the whole year again. It's not about succeeding, it's about making sure the program is locked in. Did it, did it get set? Uh, was the software installed properly? That's actually what it's all about. And once you start seeing it that way, you go, that doesn't feel good. Mm -mm. That's not what I felt. And so for me, I played college football, played a national championship. I came from a family. Everything was about competition, win, win, win. Uh, you know, my dad used to make signs to put on our bus in high school, going to the away games, beat them, crush them, kill them. I look at those now and go, why are we, why are we installing, in, instilling that into our kids? That we need, that there's some kind of success around beating in some way, shape, or form another human being. For what purpose? It doesn't exist in nature. That whole thing about survival of the fittest, it, it doesn't, that doesn't exist. That's, all, that's already been proven. All right. nature, nature exists in harmony. Mm -hmm. not in, 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 um, competition, competition doesn't work. The no. lion doesn't, doesn't wander the Serengeti and go, I need to make sure that there's no Kill other lions. Right. Yeah. I'm going to get rid of every single lion and I'm going to have all the lionesses are mine. And there's, this is all mine. It doesn't work that way. That's no. why you can see them drinking at the water hole next to the gazelles. Cause they understand there's a harmony, right? And ancient cultures, knew that and we lost it that's what people uh, people always talk to me about evolution i'm like no we've de-evolved we, we have a more civilized society that has forgotten so the things that made us work better as a human race so let me throw out so as i developed this model and i was working with partner because i was doing it real time what i came to realize is that oh partner is who we are when we're in a good mood right that's what we're signaling. It's the, you know, the lion and the gazelle. Like nobody's going to die today. But it's right. a lot of personal work when you're dealing with the pressure. Um, if you've got some kind of personal crisis, if you've got you know, business pressures coming in, to be able to maintain that level of presence, which we refer to as relaxed confidence. Because there's no tension in it, but there's still that sense of, I know what I'm doing and you're in good hands with me. So right. it's an evolution, Chip. It is. It's, and... Evolution is about raising consciousness through awareness. So it's, it's, it's slow going, but I'd say we're making progress. So now you're, obviously, I, I already went over some of the companies you've worked mm -hmm. with, right? So PayPal, Meta, et cetera. What are you seeing in Microsoft? What are you seeing going in there? 
Is there a shift happening? So, you know, obviously you and I are talking today about the whole planet. You have a tremendous amount of expertise in, in a more of a microcosm, right? So when you're working with a group of people at Meta and their leadership and they've hired you and brought you in to, to do this, but then you get to see what's actually happening and then try and improve upon it. What are you seeing in there? <clears throat> Is this resonating with them? Is there a lot of resistance? Are people, uh, was there, uh, I hate to use the word, but was there more dysfunction before you got there <laughs> that you have to work on because of the cultural environment of some of these big tech companies? So I would hit a, I would come upon resistance and then it would take me actually a couple of years to figure out what's going on because culture's always <clears throat> moving, but it moves like a glacier, so it's slow. Right. And what I came to realize, Chip, was often the people liked the way we were, not they didn't, well, they, the coaching they found valuable, but they could see where we were going with it, that it's this blend of confidence with approachability. And then they would say to me, but our leaders don't do this, but our leaders aren't doing this. And I yeah. didn't know what to, and then I finally realized, oh, you're the new leadership. Because they did, like you were saying earlier, they were coming from predator, they were coming from command and control. Right. That was kind of the best they had. But we're evolving that so that you're able to have confidence and competence, but it's a relational dynamic that you're um, so, is, so to that end, is the leadership you've been of these organizations, and again, it doesn't have to be anybody specific, but just as a generalized statement, are they open to that same coaching and evolution? Because you're, you're working with probably middle management, like just below that upper tier, and they're telling you, this is amazing, Pat, <clears throat> but they don't do this. And they're whoever right. they are, right? right. So how open, were, how, how open were they <laughs> to this type of... of transformation there it's a mix um i mean what's so affirming is that younger generations bring with them more openness more willingness we call them the road team ready open and willing right so over time we were working with emerging leaders and established leaders and now we're working with the established leaders at higher levels so there's um I, ha I have this personal little thought uh, because you know, I've read a lot about family trauma and how it's communicated multi-generationally. And honest to God, it like hit me, Chip. I went, oh, the same is true in leadership. There's, there's yeah. corporate trauma that gets passed down. And that's why I think some companies have different cultures. And so yeah. I am now realizing that some companies uh, are not ready for this, that that's they don't want to let go of the command and control form and so, other companies. So what you're saying is they need a giant emotion code is what you're saying. Oh, I think so. Oh. <laughs> so the military industrial complex, I happen to live now at this part of my life. Uh, I live in an area that is one of the main hubs of the military industrial complex. Most of my neighbors work for SpaceX, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, et cetera. And uh, there's a lot of super secret squirrel mm. programs going on here uh, that when we have a, a party of friends, I usually <laughs> am quick to bring out the tequila and try and get people to uh, tell me what the heck is actually going on. Because there's a lot of weird behavior uh, there during this last administration. You know, they switched over some of the Air Force bases to Space Force bases. <clears throat> All I, right. live about, I live very close to one of them. Mm -hmm. um, which also means on a daily basis, I'm exposed to the new things that are going on at those Space Force bases. I'm seeing blacked out helicopters, guys in black outfits. There's wow. no markings on them coming in low over the water, all kinds of wow. weird yep. stuff happening um, that, I, that I, I ask a lot of questions. That just tends to be my nature. Um, and I had a guy that, uh, that works for SpaceX and uh, we had him here and I had, he was about four or five tequilas in. And I said, uh, okay, so it, I know you're working on all the super secret squirrel stuff. And he always laughs when I use that terminology, but that's what they call it. And uh, I said, come on, man, what's, what's, what's actually going on? He said, look, I, you know I can't share with you what we're actually working on, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Look in your, and I've said this on other podcasts, look in your garage, what's driving the engine of that car? It's a combustion engine. How long is that technology running on fossil fuel? How long has that been around? 150 years, something like that. 
And he goes, and then look at the iPhone 11 in your hand. He said, does that make any sense to you? And I go, no, not at all. And he goes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, I, and, I, and he goes, and here's the best part. He goes, what's in your hand? We're way past that. <laughs> and I went, what does that mean? He goes, I've said too much. Like that, that was it. He was like, I've said too much. I like it too so much. I, we, I don't want to kill you. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I pressed him a little bit further because we, we, we later on the night, he had had a couple more tequilas. And we're talking about different stuff. And I'm asking him about all the rockets that are going up. Like, how come there's a way more rockets that go up than what is on national news? So I go, dude, where are all these things going? And he goes, look, all I can tell you is, he goes, we sent up a payload. This is last year. So he was like, we sent up a payload that had more fruits and vegetables in the payload than, than if you emptied out the space station, there isn't enough room to put all the fruits and vegetables that we sent up. And I go, so it didn't go to the space station? He goes, no. I go, where did it go? He goes, I can't tell you that. And I'm like, hold on. Shuttle program has been dismantled. We all know that. I said, everybody around here got reshuffled, you know, a lot of the, our neighbors and friends and stuff and into different programs, most of them military industrial complex programs when NASA downgraded, et cetera. We know there's nothing up there at the moment. What we're being told is a space station. So I said, so where's all this stuff going? Are you telling me? I said, if we had ships up there that have this type of volume of food going to it, I'd be able to see them. I can see the, the, right. the Starlink sat satellites go by and everything. And he goes, who told you you'd be able to see them? And I went, what? I said, dude, are you talking about cloaking? And he's like, "Again, said that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so there's just a lot of weird stuff going on. And again, it's all under that prey. You know, I, I've got an episode coming up that's going to be all on just fear, right? Mm -hmm. And to your point, when I've been working with customers and leadership, what I've been finding is exactly your model. The, mm. the, the, the little extra layer I've been adding in is, where does it come from? So understanding, so what went on in this person's life that they're acting like a predator? Or what went on in that person's life that they're acting like a prey? Mm. And what I've been finding is if I can understand at some level where that's coming from, all of a sudden I, I can kind of pull them into a partner conversation. Does that so, make sense? So, yes. Without and, having to have them go through the training. Right. Um, yeah. That's almost our purpose, Chip, is to be able to mm. show up in a way that people who maybe, and they most people wouldn't desire it, but that's in a way where they're stuck in more of a predator style and more of a prey style. Um, mm -hmm. The people who don't shift are the ones where I really go, wow, tough childhood. And, you know, it can sound humorous when I say it, but I, I mean it genuinely. <laughs> That they had a tough childhood. Well, because that's the most common denominator, right? They probably, something in their life created uh, that resp autonomic response. Yeah, and now right. I can tell you another interesting th thing that I've learned. So for the number of years I've been coaching, every once in a while I've come across somebody who's naturally partner. And I would get suspicious. And I'm like, I've had to work at this. How the hell did you get it, right? So I would ask questions. The one thing they all had in common is they moved around a lot when they were kids going to different schools. And I thought, how would that, why would that? And I, my thinking is they went into the new school more prey-like, see, I'm a nice person, please like me. And they got beat up. They go to the next school a year or two later and they're like, this time I'm coming in, right? And then they beat up and it still didn't work. And long about the third school, they were like, I'm just gonna learn how to make friends fast. That's. Yeah. And they just have this advanced ability, again, through challenges, they've developed those skills. Is it also possible that they weren't in one place long enough to have whatever the program was at that time set in enough? Um, is that possible? I guess I, a, a number of them were military. So my sense is the mm -hmm. military complex traveled with them. So that's mother culture doing yep. her thing. Um, it's a fixed program. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Got it. So it's more that they come in with this, you know, a certain level of confidence that may still be a put on, but they've learned that as a prey, you get challenged and you're taken down. But there's a level of relaxation about how they're showing up. And, and I had this one father, I told this story in one of the programs, and he came up to me afterwards, he said, <laughs> you're talking about guilt, he said, you have no idea how much you helped me with my guilt as a father, moving my kids around. They hate me. And now, I'm helping them develop partner skills. He was so relieved to realize that this challenge for them is actually causing them to have to adapt and advance. Right. So it's, 
so it's, I believe, inherent in all of us. But, you know, if we're not challenged, we kind of stick with the programming we've gotten. And this is about evolving that. So now, Pat, we, we've talked about corporate, which is your expertise. You've been very focused on that. We've talked about how it applies to people in general. So now I'm going to go a little bit broader because I, I feel like this conversation has led us to this question. <laughs> You're probably going to laugh at me when I ask you. So why is the world, so this big blue rock, mm -hmm. so we're all human beings, why are we not all understanding the partner way of approaching life? Why are there still so many prey and predators when it clearly doesn't work? I mean, we yeah. can clearly look it's at history short -term. and it does it's not work. It's very short, short term. Short term yeah. it works, right? Yeah. So and I it's was, extreme usually. There was a, a guy who wrote a dissertation and he was so kind to send it to me and I started reading it and he was talking about, um, so I'm an adult child of an alcoholic family, both sides of the family. And there's a particular wounding that happens um, and that you, you get stuck in child consciousness, which is more the predator, the prey. Let me just handle this. Let me handle this. And he talked about, you know, how do, a, a healthy development, what does that look like? And he said two things, mirroring and modeling. And mirroring, particularly for an infant as a young baby, the caretakers recognize how the child is feeling. They're able to, in a way, reflect it back. And the child starts to organize, though this is who I am. Okay. And then there's modeling. And they talked about in having an idealized parental imago. And I am sitting there going, well, what the hell do they mean by imago? Something like, <laughs> on my phone. And an imago is- You're writing adult. that down quickly, yeah. Right, right. What is that? Is an adult insect with wings. And my brain went, wait a minute, caterpillar, butterfly, caterpillar, butterfly. Oh, uh. oh, if you don't know what a butterfly looks like, you kind of caterpillar, maybe a bigger caterpillar, maybe a colorful striped caterpillar, but that's all you got to work from. So my belief is, and what I practice, my whole team practices, is being in partner because when you see it, you can be it. It's like, oh, I, I get how, how I can be here. And, and once you realize we have a tendency to look at great leaders and say, well, that's them. And my deal is, no, they're doing things that you two can do. Absorb yeah. that, be that. So I really think it's a lack of modeling and that as that is organized and people recognize what they're doing and leaders can pass on what they're doing, more people can access it within themselves. So here's another question. Okay. Why aren't, there's a sense that there is a, their whole, that they, whoever they are, that there is a group of people whether it be in this country, the planet, the world, multiple countries, whatever it is, in a seat of some type of power, known or otherwise, that is purposely trying to make sure we don't realize that, mm -hmm. what you just said, mm -hmm. right? That you, we all can be, have that in ourselves. And, and intentionally, David Icke, who I've, I've read many of his books, and if you haven't seen him, he's big on Guy TV. David Icke says, it's to keep us as little me. The category. Right? The concept is to, is to keep us as little me. There's an intention that you don't know anything. Just keep doing what we're telling you to do. Don't think too far outside the box, because that's for us. And, w and then they utilize whatever that extra stuff is. Um, so it sounds like this is, this is wide and deep, for lack of a better way of putting that, throughout culture, businesses, the economy, the government, and then you just keep expanding that because all the other countries are just different versions of everybody else to some extent, uh, some, some more positive, some more negative, some in between, but you know, everybody's kind of structured the same. And that's kind of the whole point of, of this podcast is I'm trying to get everybody to see we're all, at some level, there's, there's a... There's a, a um, a connection point or multiple connection points where we're actually all the same that supersedes or, or, or crisscrosses genders, creeds, you know, races, um, uh, cultures, uh, countries, borders, etc., cetera, uh, and start to realize that all of that stuff may have a purpose, but that shouldn't be, that shouldn't change how you are as a human being. As a human being, we shouldn't care that there are people in Mexico or Canada, right? It shouldn't matter. There are people. 
the border that was created, that's a government thing. That's all done for another purpose. That should have nothing to do with how we think about them, how we feel about them, or how we interact with them. And the same thing goes for them. So if you can get everybody doing that, then guess what happens? <laughs> so, we start actually all working together at some point. Right. So the work to be done is um, two things are flagging in my mind. The book Obedience to Authority by Stanley Milgram, based on his experience mm -hmm. in the 60s. I just read that. And all the dynamic about the authority recognizing that if we look as authority, people, normal, caring people, under the influence of authority, turn their power over to authority. So right. I was listening to a documentary on, shame, on um, George Carlin. And I mean, I'm sure I listened to him when he said it, but I didn't get it, you know, X number of years right. ago. He said, I don't trust authority at all. Now, again, I'm reading Obedience to Authority. I'm kind of like, George, I'm, I'm with you. He said, the only, the only authority I trust is inner authority. And my brain went. Right. So that's the work to be done. You know, everything we started out with, Chip, around, you know, when you identified the book title, <laughs> Mother Nature, Mother Culture, all of that influence from Mother Culture getting us, you know, into these claw, into the, uh, being a cog in the wheel, the work that we need to do is to restore our inner authority, our inner knowing, and respectfully, Correct. relationally acting on that. You can become aggressive Correct. and do it, but you're still in predator then. So there's work to be done for every individual. You got to That sounds like a good leader, a person that would be oh, like that, Pat. People choose to follow them. Yes. You see how we just pulled that all together? Yeah, you did. That, that, that kind of sounds like a good partner leader. I think that yeah. might be what you're trying to achieve. It is. That I'm, sounds, and, and that the sounds deal a little is, familiar to me. I'm doing it here first because I can <laughs> yeah. talk about it, yeah. but if I can't do it, it doesn't, I don't offer really anything but words to people. So. Yeah. 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 No, same thing goes for me. I mean, I'm doing the same thing on, on my end. I'm trying to, uh, fix me first. Uh, yes. one of the things that's been a huge tool for me is the ancient, um, Hawaiian practice of Ho'oponopono. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish I'd known that when I was mm -hmm. a kid. Uh, it has been a beautiful thing for my family. Uh, so simple. Um, those ancient cultures, those Polynesian cultures utilized it on a regular basis and God, it, it just eliminated war and strife and anger. Um, and it's just so simple because it just quickly releases just, I'm sorry, forgive me. Thank you. I love you. doesn't matter what you were arguing over differences, of opinion has nothing to do with it. It just simply just goes. Whew. So what happens is that's where I first go, right? I may Good. think I'm right. In right. that moment, I may think yeah. I know what I was doing. And then as I start to hear other people, I'm like, oh, well, that actually, yes, there's a point there. And that's a point there. Mm -hmm. And very quickly I go to, okay, you know what? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Thank you for pointing that out. And you know I what? Love you. I love you. Let's, let's, let's bring this all that's back together. Great. So. That's great. And so Pat, you, I know you have, you can talk, no, but you're being it. So I want to acknowledge that. So thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. So I have so much more to talk to you about. I would love to have you come back when you have time in your schedule because I'm this thing is just going to keep going. I'm I'm not I'm not. Stopping. And we're I'm learning. Um, I learned as we were talking. I'm ready to order a motion code. So yes, that's all. I'm, I have to go back and listen to the books you recommended and stuff. So I'm going to be doing that while I'm editing. I'll be writing it down. <laughs> I'm trying not to be rude and, and look right. to one side. Um, but one of the things we do on each episode is, uh, as I wrap it up, is I'm going to give you three different words. Okay. Um, you can answer. It's not word association per se. Uh, so you don't, don't feel like you have to add answer with a word, right? Not like a cinnamon or, or an antonym or anything like that. You can just tell me how you feel, a sentence, what have you. Um, and that's how we do each episode. So when I say the word um, peace, what, what comes to mind? Calm waters that I now recognize when the waves kick up. Oh, I'm in a reactive state of predator prey. So peace is viscerally... I recognize it as calm waters. Nice. So that's what I use nice. internally now. Beautiful. Okay, so what, what, same thing when I say the word uh, love. <laughs> this one I'm still working through, Chip. So literally, we're talking a week ago, I we realized- can, We can do an emotion code later if you want, Pat. You can call back and we'll do, we, we, I can do it remotely. So it's fine, it all works. As long as you got a magnet on your end, we can make it work. Sorry, Thank go ahead. You, <laughs> um, what I realized was, oh, for me, sugar was love growing up. Interesting. And it can get re-triggered. And now I'm realizing, oh, this that's a lack of consciousness. It made sense as a kid. I had access to sugar. Um, and I have 
um, somebody I know personally who we're, you know, whether it's joking or not, true or not, that she comes from the planet of, of um, unconditional love and you just feel it around her. So I'm blessed to have, to know what that feels like. And that's still where growth is required on my part to shift from a dependence on a substance to having it available within myself. Nice. Very good. The last word is aloha. Oh, it's so interesting what flashed in my mind was the best feeling I remember from a child was a warm breeze and the sun coming through the trees as they were dancing on the ground. And when mm -hmm. you say aloha, that's what that brings up. So it's, Isn't that it's, beautiful? it's like a, a feeling of, of the presence of a loving presence. People always think of aloha, very, very often people think of aloha as a Polynesian thing, right? Hawaii, grass skirts, that type of thing. In actuality, when you look up the definition, and I did an episode on this, um, it is a transcendent, <gasps> universal wow. word and emotion and a feeling um, that the Hawaiians have had in their culture for a very, very long time. Uh, and it's way more than just hello and goodbye. And quite frankly, your response was one of the best ones I've gotten because it, to an Hawaiian, that's what they feel like it means, mm. right? That it triggered a thought and emotion and a feeling it didn't have anything to do with their island, right? You could have been maybe in your mind thought of palm trees, but I'm sure growing up in the Northeast, that wasn't. No, that wasn't what, what I saw. Up, right? There were oak trees. <laughs> but it's that feeling that you felt is what they're trying, is what they mean by wow. aloha. So it's universal. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Check out my, I've got like a 10 minute episode just on the word aloha explaining all that, but definitely look it up when you get a chance. Anyway, okay. that was a beautiful answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for everybody watching today and listening, whether you're on YouTube or listening to it on, on one of the podcast venues, this has been another episode of Blue Rock. Uh, I've, it's been a true joy to have Pat Kirkland of Pat Kirkland Leadership. Pat, what's your website again? PatKirklandLeadership.com. Make it easy. Yeah. I, I just said it and I should have just finished with .com. It would have been all good. Uh, anyway, Pat, thank you so much. Uh, as always, you've been had a huge impact on my life. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. I love you. Uh, you. I think I talk about you to other people. I'll mention experiences that I've had, taking your courses and stuff. And it, it definitely was a synchronistic thing that's led me to what I'm doing now. So to bring it full circle, it's, it's, it's amazing. So thank you very thank much. Thank you for honoring me too, Chip. This was an absolute joy and pleasure. And you know, dear God, we can learn together and I'm getting my copy of that book. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm going to have you back on. Uh, again, for everybody at Blue Rock, as always, find peace, lead with love, and live. Aloha. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate thank it. You. We'll talk soon. Stay safe.